If the goal of education is just to get a better job, right? I remember having this conversation with students. They'd say, "My uncle's a mechanic. He owns his own shop, and I'm going to inherit. I'm going to inherit it. You know, I'm now going to be making you know six figures." There's no, nothing in this this progressive secular framework to make the case, right?、Uh, but if you if, if it is growing in wisdom, right? Well, what are you going to do in the hundred and whatever thirty hours a week that you're not working? That's the question classical education is asking. Join the best in the movement. It's conservative conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Marlo Slayback and Tom Sarouf. We're joined today by Jeremy Tate, who is the founder and CEO of the Classical Learning Test. He is an LSU grad, and he also went to the Reformed Theological Seminary, and he's based out of Annapolis. And he's going to come talk to us about. The classical learning test, classical education, education in general. Jeremy, thanks for coming on. It's great to be with you. Hey, Tom Marlo, great to be with you both. And before we begin our conversation, we'd like to thank you, the listener, for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and our mission is educating for liberty. If you'd like to help fulfill this mission with us, be sure to rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. To help us reach more listeners like yourself. So, Jeremy, I want to start off our conversation by asking, "What is the classical learning test? Where did you come up with it? Where did you hear about it? What was the the inspiration for it? And what is it designed to do?" Sure. Yeah. And Tom, just、uh, first a shout out to the ISI. We are diehard fans of ISI at CLT. Johnny Burke is on our board.、Uh, our our Soren Schwab went to Hillsdale with Johnny.、Uh, I think a lot of、uh, kind of close synergy with the mission of CLT and the mission of, of ISI.、Um, I just want to give the kind of the your your audience, you know, fair warning. I would think, man, what what could be more boring than hearing somebody talk about standardized testing? Like who cares? It's boring to take tests, and and worse than that is hearing you or anybody else talk about testing, right?、Um, standardized testing, because it's inherently boring, kind of flies under the radar as this super powerful lever that actually ends up controlling、uh, to a large degree, especially curriculum at the secondary level. Let me just kind of share what I'm talking about. Um, the CEO of the the College Board. The College Board is the most powerful organiz- educational entity in America. They own the PSAT, the SAT, AccuPlacer, all the AP content, all the AP tests. They have they have tentacles in almost every school in America.、Um, the CEO of the College Board says that it is a a statement of reality that teachers will teach to the test, and there is nothing on earth that can prevent that from being a reality. And so, if that is the case, that teachers are going to teach towards the test, then the question of well, what should be on the test is crucial. And you know, it used to be twenty、uh, years ago even that what the College Board was putting on the test was genuinely pretty neutral, right? They have gone in an aggressively hardcore,、uh, progressive, secular direction, so much so that two years ago, they're actually putting Bernie Sanders、uh, on the SAT. But the problem isn't so much what they put on the SAT and the ACT. The problem is what they leave off.、Um, students are not reading John Locke. They're certainly not reading Russell Kirk.、Uh, they're not, they're not reading T. S. Eliot, Aristotle, Plato, Flannery O'Connor, Dorothy Sayers.、Um, instead, they're reading the most dull, boring texts you could possibly find anywhere,、um, or they're reading these texts that want to push kids into. Uh, this particular way of processing and understanding the world, and so our goal、um, is to beat the College Board at their own ga- own, own game. We, we launched just eight years ago with the goal of being number one over the College Board and ACT by 2040. It's a 25 year goal,、uh, but we are are certainly、uh, on our way to getting there,、uh, thanks to, to people like Johnny who have been big advocates、uh, for what we're doing. So. How accessible is this test right now? If you go to a,、um, you know, it, it seems like th- is this something that if you go to a you know standard public school,、um, I could see like the teachers unions or some other you know bureaucratic blob being wildly against、um, something like this because of the SAT and、um, the College Board in particulars.、Um, and this is just me, <laughs> just me predicting what I could see you know occurring here,、um, but. Having this, you know, 
this control over standardized testing. Um, is this totally. something that you hope to, and maybe it already is in a place where it's available to students um, across different, you know, traditional and non-traditional or whatever is considered, I guess, non-traditional, um, like for, you know, schooling, um, I guess, public schooling, private schooling, um, homeschooling. Um, how do students access this? And um, how did you in particular get interested in, is this something that drew you um, from like a personal experience that you had with th this, these sorts of testing? And yeah. Yeah. You know, no, no little boy, I think says, I want to start a standardized test when I grow up. Uh, you know, I was a very normal little boy. I wanted to play in the NFL, like, like most normal little boys, I think, or certainly my boys, that's the case. Uh, but no, it was really born out of a personal experience. You know, I, I taught for 10 years in the public school system, taught for three years in inner city, New York, uh, which really shaped my views on, on education, how we were failing these students in, in such a horrific way. And uh, got to a faithfully Catholic school in 2015. And when I got there, I was very surprised. It's a great school. It's a school my daughters go to now, Mountain of Sales Academy. I was really shocked the influence and the power the college board had at this school. And this is what I'm, I'm talking about. Almost everything we did for marketing at this school, how we competed to attract students with other Catholic schools in the area, almost all of it was connected to the college board. And so we're marketing on what is our average SAT score or PSAT score? How many national merit? That's also college board and PSAT. Um, what is our average AP score? How many APs do we offer? Everything came back to the college board. And it really sunk in for me when these, these sweet Dominican sisters, we, we'd call them the dancing Dominicans, because uh, they were it's one of the youngest orders in the country. And uh, they, they were so excited. They were introducing two new electives. One was an intro to philosophy. Another was an intro to Christian apologetics. And it was so sad. No, hardly any kids signed up for either class. And I was part of talking to students. I was a college counselor at the time. You know, why wouldn't you want to take the philosophy class? These are the most important questions any human can ever ask. You know, what is a good life? What is happiness? Um, and the number one answer was that it wasn't any AP points. And I thought, this is crazy. How is it that the college board, this progressive, you know, institution in New York City is calling the shots for what we're doing at our Catholic school in Catonsville, Maryland? What is going on here? Uh, and so certainly I think out of that experience was kind of born the idea, well, what if there was an alternative to the college board that instead of pushing schools in the direction of mission drift was instead encouraging uh, a fluency with the greatest minds in the history of Western civilization. So it really kind of started off with a wild dream. I, I think a realization, the way my wife describes it was like getting hit by lightning. She says that I, I got out of the shower screaming a test. You could change all of education with a test, you know, and saying that if you just change this one thing, this one line of code, there are all of these downstream and upstream implications of that. That's a wonderful point. And that does what you're saying reminds me of my own high school because I went to one of these like, college prep, prestigious, you know, I, I don't know how many AP, I think I took nine AP classes in high school. Just like I was one of those people Bye. who was like in the rat race, like go, go, go. Totally. And I was good at them. And so, you know, for me, I didn't really have that much of a problem with it at the time. But, you know, thinking back, if you're teaching to a test, I think one of the other problems is like you're, the college board is teaching so you can do these AP tests so you can get into the best possible college and boom. So it's like, it's yep. like, the it's and if you have a school that is thinking in that terms of like, we're going to AP test our students to the max so that they can all get into Harvard or, you know, wherever, then everyone, it's like we're treating high school as a just a pipeline to college. Whereas, I mean, college attendance or the college graduation rate in America, I think is like 38%. So like, that's not even a majority. The idea that the college for all model is a good model. It's something we've talked about on other podcasts with other guests. I, personally, I don't think that's the model for the country, economically, socially, culturally, for all sorts of reasons. Um, but I'm wondering what you think about how this test and how this sort of way of viewing education and the purpose of education and like what we're supposed to be reading and why we're supposed to be reading it. Um, would cut against this sort of pipeline mentality. 
Yeah, I mean, we're living through a seismic shift, maybe even a collapse, I think, in some ways of education as we've known it. And, you know, so for centuries and centuries, you know, the university, it owned access to knowledge, right? It owned access to knowledge. The Harvard Library had all the books, right? And we're still learning how to, what is the value prop of a college, of a university in the digital world, right? And if you can access all the same text on your smartphone, What's the value of the Harvard Library exactly, right? So colleges are forced. They're being forced to think about kind of first principle questions of what is the value? What, what, are, what, are, we, what are we doing here? And I think that it's actually a good thing because uh, a school like, like Hillsdale, Grove City, Thomas Aquinas College, uh, Christendom, they're, they're forming students, you know, in all the, the right ways. You know, the students that graduate from there or students who go to any other school and are involved in ISI, um, it's formative. Your experience with ISI, you know, at Pitt or Boston College was formative for you. It changed who you are in all the right ways, you know, as a, as a young person. Um, and that, that's something I get, I get really excited about, Tom. I was talking to um, a professor of ours this summer who is an English professor at a um, well-respected institution that is that leans conservative and um, I was asking him about the just his impression of writing skills today because I worked professionally as a journalist for many years. Um, I studied creative writing. At one point, I was hoping to become a creative writing um, professor. And um, he he teaches English, and he was telling me he was like, you know what, Marlo, it's interesting because as um, in the last ten years of my career, I've watched at the same institution, um, I've watched the. Um, admissions rate at the school decline. Like it, it's, mm. it's, it's been, um, it's gone from, you know, this percentage to like a, you know, 20, it's 20% and um, of students are accepted into the school. But at the same time, the writing skills as That's the school has gotten more selective yep. have gotten worse. And that yep. was so interesting to me because, you know, I look at me and Tom, we look at writing samples all the time for our, our premier programs. I'm constantly looking at, you know, I've been in this position for, um, you know, over two years now. So I'm constantly looking at student submissions and, and gauging writing skills. And I was, I was a student not too long ago. And, um, th- and even just, you know, you look at our wider selection of um, the, the output of great novels and um, great writing, even if it's something down to, you know, the quality of the, the nonfiction journalism we're reading. And it just strikes me that we're not creating these, these um, you know, works of great prose or, or even, even great, you know, essay writing. And um, I was so struck by that because something that I asked, I asked him is, um, how much do you think of that is because of the, um, the standard of, you know, the SAT being what every education um, at least, you know, in high school is geared towards, um, you know, sure. that, that level of achievement. And those, at least when I was taking the SAT, it was like math, reading and writing and being able to, um, you know, crack the code, I guess, for uh, for acing those parts of the exam, especially in writing, which is something that I, I don't think, you know, we should treat all writing as, um, you know, there is good and bad writing, but there's also that that great magical space of risk taking. And that risk taking is sometimes where we get those unicorns that um, define a generation of great writers. So that's just one example of um, a place where I've seen people criticize standardized tests for being limiting and narrow and stunting these creativity skills. Is that Mm. something that you've seen? And is that something that you think that this test is able to address better than um, the college boards tests? No, Marlo, I think what you just said is is really, really profound. Why is this that we have seen at the same time, many colleges become more selective and we have seen a sharp drop in, in the writing skills? And what could possibly be the connection of the College Board and standardized testing? I, I think what it is is actually a shift in what we would consider the telos or the goal of education, right? And to kind of situate CLT in this context, I mean, CLT is part of a much, much larger classical renewal movement uh, that's happening, especially in K-12 education, is now starting to spill over uh, into the college side as well. But this is a movement that was born out of going back to first principles and saying, well, what what is an education? What's the point? And this was my experience. And I went to, to seminary after teaching for uh, a number of years. And in seminary, I remember this hitting me like a ton of bricks. I was like, oh, 
they were actually trying to do something entirely different in education. In fact, they often didn't even call it education. They would often just call it formation, right? Uh, he's being sent off to formation or she's being sent off to, to formation. Um, and the idea that was that it was the cultivation of virtue. Um, it was the transmission of this cultural and intellectual inheritance. I, I have this great vision etched into my brain of going to a bar mitzvah when I was thinking through all of these big ideas about education. It was my daughter's friend. She's a very tiny, tiny little girl. And it was kind of funny. Her parents handed her physically this massive uh, you know, copy of the Torah. Uh, and you could hardly see the girl when she got it, but I saw this image of one generation handing it to the next, this treasure. I'm like, that's it. That's what education is. Okay, well, let's contrast that with walk into any secondary classroom in any public school in the country and ask the students or the teachers or the administrators, why are we here? What are we doing here? And they're going to say something like to get a better job. It's going to be connected to, I mean, literally my last year or two in education, I was asking students this, not because I knew the answer. I was asking because I I had become... Um, I'd become deeply skeptical of the whole project of education as I had experienced it as a teacher. Almost every kid would say, when I would say, why are we here? What's the point of school? Almost everyone would say to get a better job. And then I would write up on the board, the object of education is to learn to love what is beautiful, which is, is kind of a synthesis of something Plato says in the Republic. Students were, dis they, they had no category for that. What, what, is that what does that even mean, Right. We've totally bought hook, line, and singer this very utilitarian vision for education. But I think here is the good news, right? If you go to one of these great classical schools, a place like Sacred Heart in Grand Rapids or the Heights in Potomac, Maryland, right? These schools are all over the country. Our Lady of Lords in Denver, tons of classical charters, great hearts all over Texas and Arizona. And you ask those students and those teachers and those administrators, why are we here? You're going to hear a different response. They're going to say things like to grow in wisdom to grow in wonder. Some may say to grow in a love for Jesus Christ, right? Um, it's a richer, deeper. And this, this spills over into things like writing skills, right? To, to, to write well is to learn how to, to think well and to live well uh, at the same time. These are all deeply, deeply connected. And so we think that the college board, and I, I love to tell this story, the early, early days of CLT, I begged and pleaded um, to, to Robbie George to give me 30 seconds of his time. And when I begged enough, he was very gracious and gave me about 30 minutes of his time. And when he came to understand what we were doing, he put his name behind it and, and gave CLT an endorsement that just set us off to the races. But in that conversation, he described the college board really as, as the single entity, maybe most responsible for the radical secularization uh, of education toward these utilitarian ends, right? And, and this is where the problem is. If the goal of education is just to get a better job, right? I remember having this conversation with students. They'd say, my uncle's a mechanic. He owns his own shop and I'm going to inherit, I'm going to inherit it, you know? And now I'm going to be making, you know, six figures. There's no, nothing in this, this progressive secular framework to make the case, right? Um, but if, you, if, if it is growing in wisdom, right? Well, what are you going to do in the hundred and whatever, 30 hours a week that you're not working? That's the question classical education is asking, right? Not, not college and career readiness. And SAT and ACT have absolutely championed, um, you know, this, this college and career. One more just kind of note on this, Marlo. We want to be very careful at CLT. I think in my generation, I'm a bit older, older than y'all, probably a lot, just turned 42. Um when, you know, SAT score was like engraved on your forehead. Everybody knew your score. I still remember my score. And it was like, you're going to be a 1020 for a life. You're nothing more, right? I mean, people, it, it was too much. It was too much. A lot of people go to the other extreme now. Uh, we totally get rid of the test altogether, right? What we're trying to say at CLT is, look, it's a helpful snapshot into some really, really key academic areas at a given moment in time. It's nothing more than that. It doesn't define who you are, you know, but what we have seen are schools like Harvard, like the Ivy Leagues, um, that they, they've gone away from a standardized test precisely so they can bury merit 
uh, and objective, um, objective readiness in how they're shaping their class uh, coming in. I had a different question, but let me just ask, like, how, how does the CLT, um, like, what's the grading rubric or the mechanisms? Like, if I were to take the CLT, what would I get back as a, as a result of my work? Sure. Yeah. You know, that's one of the things we wanted to do. The SAT, ACT, it's very confusing. You know, you answer 170 questions or something on the ACT and then you're like, what? It's out of 36 points. How does this work exactly? It's very unclear. Well, CLT really tried to simplify all of this. 120 questions. It's 120 points and it's 120 minutes, right? 120, 120, 120. Now, that doesn't mean exactly that if you score 114 correct, you're going to get 114 necessarily. The test is scaled in a similar way the SAT and ACT would be scaled given the cohort of students that happen to be testing that particular day. Uh, but very simple, 40 questions are going to be gr uh, reading, verbal comprehension. The main difference is just going to be the source material. Instead of reading Bernie Sanders, maybe reading John Locke or Russell Kirk, right? On the grammar writing part, um, we're, we're looking for something similar. Again, grammar, spelling, syntax, punctuation, that kind of thing. But again, the source material is going to be a lot better. On the math side, the quantitative reasoning, those last 40 questions, you know, we talked earlier on about how the test ends up kind of driving the curriculum. I remember even in, in the 90s, and I'm feeling so, so old. It's so depressing. Uh, my teacher saying, you know, you can't use a calculator in my class and you can't use one on the SAT. And it was like, well, conversation settled. Like, what else would you say? You can't use one on the SAT. Of course, you can't use one in her class. Well, then the SAT allows a calculator. And suddenly, an entire generation becomes dependent on a device. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is in what's the point of math? Is math just to fix bridges? Is it just to solve problems? Or is math formative? Does math order your thinking? Does it actually change who you are uh, as a person? And uh, so that's why we have gone back to no calculator on CLT math. So I, I love the point you made about um, schools eliminating the SAT requirement because that's been, um, obviously, there are ideological uh, goals there um, for for why they did, did that and um, you know, some groups, I remember when I worked as a journalist, um, in particular, you know, Asian American groups. Um, and I remember in California speaking to a few Asian American parents who were saying, you know, my, my child works so hard to ace this test and they're, they study very diligently. And, um, you know, the, this test is, is, especially for students who come from, um, you know, poor backgrounds, SAT is in, in, this is maybe this might sound like a defense of the SAT because this was certainly in my case as someone who did well in the SAT. Sorry to like have it on my forehead or right. whatever, but um, it was like my opportunity to actually, you know, go totally. you know, like shoulder, shoulder to shoulder with people who had a lot more money than my family did and had the tutors and still be able to um, be on a similar standard as like, you know, um, one of those students in the eyes of the university I was applying to. And so there have been, you know, different, um, schools, I think the UC system is more or less, I don't remember, I think it was maybe specific UCs or maybe across the University of California, but um, I, I do remember them re, uh, reconsidering whether they were going to um, discontinue the use of those standardized tests. Have you seen like in, in this, this has been probably, you know, a little less than a decade now since a lot of um, the DEI stuff has largely influenced the, I think, personally, I think, has influenced the use of, the, of this sort of testing, of standardized testing. Have you seen an opportunity for a test like the CLT to, um, you know, rise as an alternative? Um, or I guess, what's the landscape now since it seems like a lot of schools are moving away from, um, and elite schools at that, moving away from the use of standardized tests or like kind of, um, you know, changing requirements so that the the pressure isn't um, on standardized testing like it used to be? That's a great question. And I love to encourage your audience to actually think about standardized testing. It is kind of like the crazy uncle who comes on, on Christmas and Thanksgiving and, and says like the things you're not supposed to say out loud at the dinner table. A standardized test is the least PC tool that I know of, right? 
And it shows us very powerfully all of these things that we're actually not supposed to say out loud anymore, right? For example, students with two married parents do better across the board, right? You can't say that without upsetting a lot of people, right? Um, you got to be sensitive to those those kind of things. But we see that as well with, with demographic groups, right? Why is it the average SAT score of Asian Americans is higher than other demographic groups, right? Is it racist? I, I mean, it's it's a test. I don't know. It's, it's a metric. It's a score, right? Um, and so it forces, I think, in a way that is kind of deeply uncomfortable. And I, I think that is why a lot of the elite schools – um, you know, wanting again, as I said, to kind of bury uh, the concept of merit, um, have pushed back. But if we are a country of people who value merit, who value achievement, who value the pursuit of excellence, um, it is, I think, absolutely crucial. And that's why I think some schools, uh, and now even MIT, you know, has gone back to requiring a test. Um, you know, and, and what MIT has actually been saying is look, when you get away from the standardized test, you end up overemphasizing connections and like uh, the kind of the soft skills um, that actually affluent kids have more opportunity at it. So in some ways, it really is an equalizer. Look, we actually don't hate the old SAT either. Um, you know, the old SAT was an incredible tool. You know, students who were in the Mississippi Delta or like inner city Chicago who may have been lost. I mean, Harvard and Princeton, they were basically – you know, they're, they're, they're uh, admitting all of the kids from the New England boarding schools, you know, your Phillips Exeter and whatnot. And suddenly there's a tool where this kid in, you know, Mississippi Delta, who's this kid, right? 1580. This is incredible. And so it, it allows, you know, kind of incredible minds to be discovered and incredible merit and hard work to be discovered uh, as well. So we want to we want to keep rewarding that. And I, I think for us to recover um, merit on college campuses. This has got to be uh, part of the conversation for sure. And Jeremy, I want to go back to the question I was going to ask, and I don't know exactly how I'm going to ask it. So let's see how I can get there. Um, I was an education major at BC. Um, and part of that experience was teaching. So I taught at a Catholic middle school for a semester, best semester of college far and away. Uh, kids were delightful. It was really fun to teach, but Something that through four years of education major classes, um, which are, I think, and I've said this on this podcast before, producing some of truly the worst ideas and sending them off. Um, but one of these, I think, is what I call like relevancy studies. Like everything must be made relevant to today, which is why like AP modern European history would have like a, a Bernie Sanders question on the AP test, even though like completely... Totally. Yeah. So it's like, we have to always make it relevant to today, whether that's an analogy or an allusion to a similar, but not really the same political situation or just something quote unquote relevant to the students' lives. I think for part of the, a little bit of the reason is what you were saying is like school can be kind of boring. Um, learning old dusty facts can be kind of, it, that doesn't necessarily inspire. I definitely saw that with a lot of the boys in my class. Um, they were excited when I was like playing football with them at recess, not necessarily like me talking about Andrew Jackson. Um, yeah. I couldn't make it fun, but um, I think the other part though, is, and this is where the rub is, is like, well, if it's relevant, it must be like, we have to make it diverse or um, be like, basically like, but there's no time mm. for Shakespeare anymore. There's no time for Plato. These are the dusty old white men or these people have nothing to tell us anymore. And so I think part of it is a, it's a deliberate but subtle-ish attempt at fracturing us from tradition, from our past, and from some very important works that cut against the ethos of the day. Um, where was I going with that? Oh, I think the rele so this relevancy problem we have, I'm yeah. wondering from your perspective with the CLT, I guess, how, or like with, with classical education in general, I guess how you make it relevant, but also cut against the sort of I think stupid and dangerous fracturing. Do you know what I mean? Oh, so stupid and so silly and, and kind of embarrassing. You know, Dan Daniel Buck, I love Daniel Buck. Follow him on Twitter if you're not already. But he, he tweeted something a couple of weeks ago with the, the teacher's union. And it was, you know, how to bring little Wayne into your classroom. Well, guess what? The last thing any 15 year old wants is you touching little Wayne or any of their other favorite artists. 
They're like, get out of my life. Stop. Right. Like you're not going to make be cool by bringing little Wayne into the classroom. Right. This is what is really cool. Right. Is, is a total, uh, disconcerned completely about, about being relevant. Right. When a teacher pulls out in front of the class, copy the odyssey and says, look, for 25, a hundred years, this story has shaped the hearts and minds of young people. And now it's your turn, right? That's something that's timeless, right? This chasing after relevancy, this book just came out. Kids are smarter than we give them credit for. They know that nobody's going to care about the book in two years again, and that nobody's going to read it. They actually do have a concept for things like staying power, you know? And uh, I think that is the value prop, you know, for sure of of classical education. This was very interesting to me, Tom. Um, when I was teaching and I was coming from the world of youth ministry and my big fear as a teacher was being boring. I was terrified of being boring. And so I had like a whole laundry list of like funny stories I would kind of like peel off into if I thought my students were bored. It was like all about keeping them engaged. Then I, I noticed something very strange is that even like the most checked out kid, if I if I was teaching on something like the Holocaust or Stalinist Russia or something like that, suddenly the, the student was super dialed in. And I think the reason is like there is this innate hunger to talk about the human capacity for good and the human capacity for evil. And it is all of this, this the, the transcendentals that we have ripped out of education. And when you do that, what you get is boredom. You get apathy. It becomes irrelevant, right? The human heart is hunger, hungry for truth, goodness, and beauty. And without that, students just can't wait to get out of the classroom. And so in some ways, it is, it is far more relevant to show them things that are truly timeless and that are not going to go away, right? Students get it when you say, look, Taylor Swift is cool now, and she's been pretty cool for about 20 years, right? What about Mozart? What about Beethoven, right? Who's going to be more influential in 30 years, right? Is it going to be Taylor Swift or is it going to be Mozart? Well, um, they're interested in this concept uh, of, of staying power and timelessness and, and classics. Uh, and so it is a, a lack of confidence, I think, that, that we've had. People need to wake up that it's been a disaster, uh, this attempt to, to make things cool and relevant. Students just think it's a joke. Yeah, that, I was actually, it's funny you mentioned um, this interest, especially among, you know, young people for, um, you know, their, their inquiry into the capacity for not only human good, but evil, because I was, I've been on a deep dive lately trying to understand the American obsession, because it, it seems uniquely, this is kind of a tangent, but uniquely American, the obsession with like true crime. And I almost wish that, uh, mm -hmm. especially, you know, with like serial killers, like it's totally bizarre to me that Netflix does entire series on like, you know, on like the, um, on like Richard Ramirez or totally. Richard Ramirez, I think his name was. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, I wish I could channel that interest into, like you said, like interest in like Bolshevik Russia or something. So at least there's a edifying, you know, um, historical context we could develop mm. from that. But it does seem like we live in a world where junk food, whether that's intellectual junk food or like literal junk food is, um, just seems much more, um, savory. And, uh, so how do you, you know, if you're, this actually is a good way to, um, you know, wind down the conversation, but I think I, I want to, you know, make sure that any parents that are listening have kind of a, a, a better feel for how they can tap into this sort of like resource and this community of um, educators. And also, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are parents and um, other folks who are associated with the CLT who might make for, um, you know, great ambassadors, but What's the reach of the CLT and how do you use it to um, help children and, you know, budding, um, whatever it is, whatever, wh whether they're academics or um, whether they want to be um, even, you know, even entering the trades. Um, how do you try to puncture through the that like appetite for junk food with something that is more nutritious and um, something that isn't perhaps as, um, you know, widely accepted as like the, like the, you know, SAT and ACT are, but that can potentially yield um, fruit that mm -hmm. really, you know, strike the core of what a um, authentic and true education is. 
Yeah, it's a great question. I love the analogy, you know, with with junk food. And, and I mean, to be totally clear, like there there is no substitute for just hard work. Like educating a young person is very, very hard work. And, you know, Tom, Tom went to BC, major in education. You, you probably got a Bachelor of Science. Is that right? I was a BA or BE. It was a BA. OK. OK. Uh, and, and, and look, but we, we've had this this shift uh, in education um, from from thinking about it. Uh, you know, as an art, you, know, you go back to the old Oxford model. It's very one-to-one. It's very relational, right? Uh, we have a ton of research now that shows that, that education and who you learn from, the relational component is huge. This is why homeschooling can be very, very effective. If it's with a close relationship, you know, with mom and dad and even siblings. If you think right now, the teachers, if you go back in your head, the teachers you learn the most from, there's probably a connection there. There's probably a relationship, you know, there. Uh, as well, you know, uh, and so I, I think it is the the hard hard work. I remember as a teacher realizing, probably my second or third year, I was like, "Wow, it really matters that the students actually believe that I really like them if they're going to do well in my class." Like that's something they never told me in ed school. Um, that like your students need to believe that you genuinely like them. Yeah, you know, it's not that you're chasing after relevance, you know, but that you you absolutely want you know the very best for them, which means you're gonna you're gonna push them you know, academically. It's a lot easier to coast, you know, as a teacher. I mean, we're in a moment right now, we're not just students, but totally teachers as well. I am convinced that there are a ton of chat GPT created essays that are graded on chat GPT by teachers, you know, and it's this really silly handoff where nobody does the work on either side, you know. True education takes a lot of sweat and there are no no, no shortcuts uh, around that, you know, at the end of the day. I think it's, it is a matter of loving a young person enough, if it's your own kid, uh, you know, or someone else, um, to think about, you know, their formation, uh, you know, so they can grow into the person God intended them to be. Jeremy, that's very well said. And so I think that's a great note for us to end on. Thanks for joining us. Uh, if people want to follow more of your work, go check out the, the, C, the classical learning test. Get involved with what you're up to. Where should they look? Where should they go? Thanks, Tom. Yeah, cltexam.com uh, is our website. Uh, again, we offer tests going all the way down to third grade now uh, as well. And um, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Jeremy Tate 41 Excellent. Well, thank you again, Jeremy. And thank you to our listeners for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this episode, be sure to head over to our website at isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, select Modern Age articles, lectures, debates, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we'll see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.